And when I heard this story, it, it always struck me because it taught me that we have to look at struggle, we have to look at pain, we have to look at discomfort, and we have to look at all the obstacles and difficulties that we face in life in a different light. And if we can become comfortable with the uncomfortable situations that we inevitably encounter, then our quality of life can be significantly changed. This, uh, for this next hour and we'll be discussing I hope some things that will give you some food for thought and really be uh, stimulating in different ways. I just want to check the chat is working. Could I just ask uh, all of you on the call uh, just to type into the chat where you're joining us from today. It would be great to just uh, to know that you're there, that you can hear me, that uh, you are uh, connecting. Okay, wonderful. We have, um, yes, we have uh, India joining. Oh, we we have uh, also uh, China. Thank you so much. And uh, Germany as well, uh, Vietnam, wonderful. So we have a diverse uh, geographical spread today. That's wonderful. So here I am with you, uh, Intel. Uh, the famous campaign was Intel Inside. And when we know our computers have Intel Inside, then we, uh, we rest assured we have that confidence that everything will be, um, that everything will be good. So we're also going to do some inner engineering today and discuss some aspects of spirituality and success and the world we're living in today. And I hope uh, you all will engage with the content and we welcome you to share your questions, your comments, your reflections on the chat and we'll be having some time at the end of the session today to uh, field some of those questions. So I'll speak for about 45 minutes and then what we'll do is we'll kind of open it up to a bit of discussion and I think Sapna will uh, facilitate that for us. So today I have a little bit of a presentation I'd like to share with you and I hope you'll all be able to see it um, entitled Becoming Comfortable with the Uncomfortable. Can I just check uh, Sapna that you can see the presentation? Yes. Oh, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Excellent. I want everyone just for some moments to reflect on this butterfly. The reason I put this picture of a butterfly for today's uh, session is that there's a very, very famous story of a man who was once watching a caterpillar. And as we know, the caterpillars, they go through their evolution in a cocoon and eventually break out of that cocoon and emerge as a butterfly. And so as this man was watching the butterfly coming out of the cocoon, uh, he saw it was a big struggle. It was full of um, hard work to break through that cocoon and the, the different layers. And as he saw the butterfly struggling to come out of the cocoon, out of his kind compassion, he decided to get a small razor blade and just slit open the cocoon skin so that the butterfly could very easily come out. And so he did that with his kind heart and he slipped open the cocoon. And sure enough, it opened up and the butterfly in all its beauty flew out of the cocoon into the, into the atmosphere. And he felt very happy about that. But then within 15 seconds, he saw something shocking. He saw that the butterfly flew out but then immediately the butterfly started crashing and went towards the ground and uh, was struggling there on the ground and eventually died. And he was wondering what he could learn from this. And then he realized that it was nature's arrangement for the butterfly to have to struggle to come out of the cocoon. Because in that struggle of coming out of the cocoon, the butterfly would develop the strength in its wings that would then uh, facilitate it for the rest of its journey in life. And because it hadn't gone through that struggle of strengthening its wings by opening the cocoon, he realized that it wasn't able to live. 
And when I heard this story, it always struck me because it taught me that we have to look at struggle, we have to look at pain, we have to look at discomfort, and we have to look at all the obstacles and difficulties that we face in life in a different light. And if we can become comfortable with the uncomfortable situations that we inevitably encounter, then our quality of life can be significantly changed. And so that is what we are going to be talking about today. I want you to get into a space where you're ready to challenge the ways that we've always been taught to look at life and look at the world. At the beginning of today's session, I want to share with you something which will help you to do this counterintuitive thinking. In the world we're living in today, there are many, many lies. But it's said very, very shockingly that if a lie is told loud enough and if a lie is told long enough, then that lie can eventually become a so-called truth. More shocking than that is that if, if enough people accept this so-called truth in any given community, society or group, then this truth can eventually become a culture. And perhaps even more worrying than that is if that culture is then passed down to the next generation, then that culture tends to perpetuate and eventually that culture becomes a so-called tradition. And therefore, people are then born into that tradition which is based on a so-called culture which is based on a so-called truth that's actually a lie. But because they're born into that tradition, we then begin to function according to those principles without questioning it. There are many, many biases in our thinking. There is a consensus bias so that if enough people seem to accept a so-called truth, then we also tend to much more easily accept it. There's an anchoring bias by which the first thing that we hear in, our, uh, in any given subject tends to take root in our consciousness much, much stronger. And therefore, we're much more likely to be heavily influenced by the first messages that we hear about any given subject. There's also a framing bias whereby if a certain... Uh, concept is presented in a certain way, in a certain language, by someone who looks a certain way, then we're much more likely to accept it as truth. <coughs> and there's also <coughs> something called a self-serving bias, whereby that which <coughs> serves our personal needs, that which fulfills our own motivations or desires or agendas, we're much more likely to accept as truth. Why am I sharing with you this with you at the beginning of today's talk is that we often have a perception of reality. We often have a worldview by which we approach life, um, which then determines everything, our emotions, our decisions, our reactions to various situations. But that worldview often is based on different aspects of um, truths that we've accepted. But those truths, it's good for us to regularly challenge them so that we can open up newer ways of approaching life and perhaps greater opportunities. And one of those counterintuitive thoughts that I want to share with you today is the idea of being comfortable with the uncomfortable. Because generally, in the world we're living in today, discomfort or some level of facing an uncomfortable situation is automatically seen by us as bad. Uncomfortable situations are seen as uh, negative and limiting. Uncomfortable situations are something that are seen as our enemy. And uncomfortable situations are things that we automatically try to dissipate and uh, um, remove from our life. Perhaps, however, the uncomfortable and discomfort that we face in our life 
can be looked at in a different way. Life is full of uncomfortable situations. We have a plan, we think our life is going to go like this. When we're fresh out of university and we first have our job, we may have a specific life route that we think we'll take. But then as we begin to navigate life, then we realize the reality is quite different. It's full of twists and turns, ups and downs. Life can almost be like a roller coaster ride. And difficult as that is, it's natural. Because if you go, for example, <coughs> into a hospital and you get your ECG done, then it will look something like this. There are peaks and there are also troughs. And then there are peaks again and then there are troughs. It goes up and down, up and down. If this diagram were to be completely flat, that would not be good news because that would signify death. The point here is that life itself means ups and downs. Life means success and failure. Life means uh, the positives and what seemingly seem like the negatives. Life is full of variety and part of that variety is we will face discomfort. We will face difficulties in our life. In fact, we will face what we call life quakes through our journey in this world. I want to ask all of you um, just one question before I continue my presentation. I want to ask you, some of you in this, on this conference may have been in an earthquake in your life. May, you may have gone through that experience. An earthquake is not something that you can predict. You don't know when an earthquake will take place. You don't know on what scale that earthquake will take place. You don't know where an earthquake will take place. But these earthquakes happen in the world and they almost seem to turn our life upside down. <clears throat> On the journey of life, each one of us will also face life quakes. And I want you to think for a second and I'm going to ask you to share on the chat. What do you think are some of the life quakes that we will go through in our life? What do you think are some of the situations that everyone has to go through which are uncomfortable and which change the parameters of our journey and our direction in this life? I'd like to ask some of you to share on the chat what some of those life quakes could be. Yeah, Sapna says losing a loved one. Uh, Christian says illness. Yes, Roman says changing your location, changing where you live. Um, yes, these are all life quakes. Can you think of other things that may happen in life which uh, change financial situation? Yes, failures, um, sickness and our own personal health may change. Um, marriage. <laughs> Yes, that marriage can also be a life quake. Uh, natural disasters, yes, the environment around us, accidents. Yeah, I just want all of you to take stock of some of these, uh, these options that are being given on the chat. I'm going to reshare my presentation. Yes, there are various life quakes that we will go through in our journey. On average, it's said that in everyone's life, there will be between three and five major life quakes that we all have to go through. One major life quake is relationships. Uh, relationships will be formed, <coughs> excuse me, and often relationships will break. Relationships that we thought would last forever, relationships that often gave us the most happiness and contentment and most positivity and hope in our life. Sometimes in a very short time, relationships can sometimes turn upside down. Relationships can turn from being very, very sweet to incredibly toxic. 
Uh, these are life quakes that we will experience. There may be changes in the environment, natural disasters, but there could also be changes in the government. There could also be things like a global pandemic, which changes, which puts us in an uncomfortable situation. Sometimes there are changes in career or finance or our fortunes. Sometimes we, have made, we may have made investments or we have, may, may, may have made plans. And those could uh, change very, very quickly. Perhaps life quakes take place for you uh, on a physical and mental level. In a very short time, sometimes our physical health can change. Sometimes we have challenges on a mental level. Uh, the World Health Organization says that mental health is one of the most concerning parts of modern medicine today. Um, our ability to stay uh, with an equanimity of mind is being challenged. And we all may also face life quakes in the form of identity and meaning. Uh, oftentimes people have an existential uh, confusion or what we call a midlife crisis where we've pursued a certain life path for so long and then later on we question whether that actually still holds true for us and whether we actually find happiness in those things. So can you see how uncomfortable situations and some level of discomfort is inevitable in the world we're living in? But how do we navigate those uncomfortable situations? That is going to be the key to the quality of our experience in this life. Our net our default reaction when there is an uncomfortable situation is to try to immediately eliminate that discomfort, is to try to immediately take that discomfort away, is to try to immediately create some kind of external solution which will dissipate the pain. And basically our modus operandi is that when uncomfortable situations come, we immediately try to make them comfortable. Now, am I saying there's something wrong with that? I'm not saying, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's a human reaction. When you have a headache, you take a painkiller. Or when, there's, uh, when your car breaks down, then you go to the mechanic to get it fixed. However, Today what I want to share with you is that ancient spiritual wisdom from around the world in practically every single culture, creed and from every geographical location helps us to understand that along with making the uncomfortable comfortable as a natural reaction to the difficulties of life, if we learn the art of becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable <clears throat> and learning that those uncomfortable situations and the discomfort that comes has something incredible to offer us, then not only will we be able to uh, navigate those situations without being displaced, but we won't just go through problems in this world, but we'll actually grow through those problems and actually receive many, many gifts from situations which sometimes feel very, very difficult and very, very disheartening and demotivating. I am going to share with you six gifts of uncomfortable situations that are presented to us in our life. As I share these different gifts that the spiritual teachers tell us we gain from uncomfortable situations, I want all of you on the call to think of an uncomfortable situation that you're going through in your life at the moment. It could be either, it could be any of those life quakes that I've mentioned, something to do with relationships or health or career or the environment around you, some, something that's causing you a level of discomfort in your life. And now I want you, as I go through these six gifts of uncomfortable situations, I want you to see whether you may be having the opportunity to receive any of those gifts in the current situation that you're in, which might help you to look at that situation in a different way. The first gift of an uncomfortable situation 
is that it deepens your wisdom. They say some people learn from hearing. A few more people learn by hearing and then observing. But most people learn by experiencing. Often time, only until we experience something, only until we go through a practical, tangible, real life experience, do we actually learn something in its deepest way. And therefore, experience is sometimes a difficult teacher, but it's definitely a teacher which will instill a lot of wisdom within you. According to the ancient Eastern scriptures of the Vedas, nothing in our life happens by chance. And what the Vedic scriptures talk about is the universal law of karma. And this law basically states that everything that happens in life is not simply random, is not simply by chance. Everything that we encounter in our life is an opportunity to actually furnish our inner wisdom and allow us to learn lessons that we have not learned simply by hearing and by observing. I want you to think of any uncomfortable situation you're in at the moment and take some time to think, what can I learn from this situation? What wisdom am I being uh, given through this difficulty I'm going through? If you have a pen and paper, you can even think of this situation and write down a few things. The second gift of uncomfortable situations is it builds your character. I once saw a famous cartoon and it was someone going through a very difficult situation and they looked up at God and they said, God, can you change my situation? And in the next box was a cartoon of God who looked down at the person and said, but I sent that situation so you change yourself. And this is a very, very uh, deep insight as well, that often the situations that we're sent are sent by the universe, sent by providence to help us to change our character, to change our approach. Oftentimes, we uh, seem to encounter the same situation again and again and again. It's almost like Groundhog Day. And the reason for that may be that situations are being sent to us so we change and we build our character. But if we don't learn those lessons and become a better version of ourselves, we tend to encounter those difficulties again and again. It is said that you only develop muscle when there is some level of resistance. When you go to the gym, you lift heavier weights you uh, put a higher setting on the rowing machine where there's more resistance because it's said that as there is resistance and you push against that, you develop muscle. So in the same way, the pain and the discomfort and the uncomfortable situations we encounter are the resistance of the universe. And by facing that resistance, we develop our internal muscles of tolerance, of humility, of uh, equanimity of consciousness, of uh, mind uh, serenity and control. And therefore, another gift of uncomfortable situations is they help you to build your character. John the Baptist, he said, God puts great personalities through great trials and tribulations so that they can go on to do great things in the world. Discomfort builds your character. Here's another gift of uncomfortable situations. Uncomfortable situations reveal your opportunities. They reveal oftentimes newer opportunities. Sometimes a chapter has to end. Sometimes a door seems to close and sometimes obstacles seem to come up and we can become extremely discouraged. Or we can see that sometimes one chapter has to close so that a new chapter can open up. We can see that sometimes one door has to close so that we can see 
the other five doors that are then opening up. Sometimes we have to see that there is an obstacle on one path because we're trying, we're being redirected to another more progressive, positive, pragmatic and a path which has more potentiality. Most of us don't like to change because change is painful. Most of us are scared of taking up opportunities because we're comfortable in our current situation and we're in fear of failure. And therefore, sometimes the only way we can be redirected to those greater opportunities and the greater potentiality is by being forced out of a particular situation. They say we only tend to change when the pain of the current situation outweighs the pain of change. And therefore, sometimes what happens is our situation becomes uncomfortable so that we're impelled to look for uh, greener pastures somewhere else. And therefore, pain and discomfort and difficult situations are also a way in which new opportunities are revealed in our life. Here's another gift of an uncomfortable situation. It resets your priorities. Have you noticed that when an uncomfortable or painful situation comes, then it helps you to focus again on the bigger picture. It helps you to focus again on what's really, really important to you and what needs to be pursued at this moment in time. Pain reminds us of what is important to us in our life. And oftentimes in comfort and in security, we become oblivious to the bigger picture and our priorities. So see how discomfort sometimes resets your priorities. Here's a very interesting one. Pain also strengthens your resolve. Sometime in our psyche, we have trauma. And what we often think of is that trauma is evidence of uh, pain that we went through in the past. But sometimes we can see that the traumas that we have are not just uh, memories of pain that we experienced in the past, but the trauma that we, uh, or the scars that we have as a result of trauma, they are also proof of our resilience. Yeah, think about this deeply. Scars are not just proof of pain that we've experienced in the past, but scars are also proof of your resilience. That despite that difficult situation, you're still here. Despite that difficult situation, you're still functioning. Despite that difficult situation, you're still moving forward in your life. And so, when we have scars as a result of trauma, don't always see them as a, uh, uh, a reminder of pain but also see them as a reminder of the resilience that you have in your consciousness. Pain doesn't just make you stronger, but pain also reminds you of strength that you've had within your own consciousness. And finally, uncomfortable situations help to awaken our gratitude. They say gratitude is the mother of all qualities. And so when we have gratitude, all other good qualities come into our character. I liken gratitude to digestion. That we've, so many amazing things have happened in our life. And gratitude is almost like the process of digestion. When we think about all of those wonderful things that have happened, then what happens is we get the full nourishment from all of those experiences. And not just that, it frees space within our um, digestive system to receive more. And sometimes what I would share with you is that pain is something like a fire 
which can help the digestion of gratitude. Because when we go through difficult situations, we realize how much we've actually taken things for granted in our life. And so that pain helps us to be more grateful for what we have received in our journey. I hope this is helpful to you because all of us on the call undoubtedly are going through difficult situations in our life. And I hope these six uh, mantras, if you like, there's something that you can put up on your wall and something you can look at so that when you are going through difficult situations, instead of trying to immediately mitigate it and run away from those situations, we can try to draw amazing wealth from them. In order to extract these gifts from the difficulties of life that we go through, it requires a change of vision. In ancient Sanskrit, which is one of the oldest languages in the world, the Sanskrit word uh, for vision is darshan. And it literally means to see. But darshan or to see doesn't just mean a physical seeing. It doesn't just mean the act of seeing with one's eyes. But darshan also refers to one's worldview. It refers to the direct and intuitive vision of the truth. And it's the lens through which we comprehend environments, events and experiences. In order for one to extract those six gifts that I just showed you from uncomfortable situations, it means we have to change our vision. There's a famous story of two young boys who grew up uh, with an alcoholic father and they followed these two young boys and later in their life one of the boys also became an alcoholic and the other boy stayed away from alcohol his whole life. They went to the first boy and they asked him, you became an alcoholic, why did you become an alcoholic? He said, my whole life I watched my father who was an alcoholic. They went to the boy who never touched a drop of alcohol in his own life and they asked him, why did you stay away from alcohol? He said, my whole life I grew up watching my father who was an alcoholic. The interesting thing is, they both saw the same thing, but they elicited something very different and they reacted to it very, very differently because they had a different darshan or a worldview. Essentially, our darshan or our worldview of life is made up of, firstly, our condition. Each one of us come into this world with a certain nature, with a certain personality, with certain... Um, we're wired in a certain way to respond and we have a certain personality. And that very much shapes our approach to life and our vision of life. However, as we then enter this world, we are uh, constantly evolving because we're interacting with the world around us. We interact with different environments, with different people, we encounter different experiences, and this also changes our vision of life. And so modern psychology would say our vision is basically nature plus nurture and that determines how we see life. But the ancient spiritualists explain that there is a third element which can change our vision of life, and that is connection or spirituality. When we access spiritual wisdom, when we immerse ourselves in spiritual practices like meditation, yoga and other uplifting things for the consciousness, when we engage with people who are functioning on a spiritual level and have developed spiritual consciousness, then through this development of spirituality, we can then transcend even the limitations of our nature and nurture and open up a whole new way of looking at the world and looking at life. In the world, they used to think 
that the most successful people were the ones who had high IQ. But later on, they realized that along with IQ, you need EQ. Because you can have all the intelligent ability in the world, but if you don't know how to manage your emotions, emotional quotient, then factually you can't access that intelligence and utilize it appropriately. But later on they realized that it's not just about IQ and EQ, but it's also about SQ or spiritual quotient. What is spiritual quotient? Spiritual quotient is our deeper vision of life. Spiritual quotient are the, is the deeper principles and spiritual values that we live by. Spiritual quotient encompasses a greater worldview, a deeper faith. And spiritual quotient is the uh, background on which we are able to uh, look at all of life's events with a broader vision in mind. And so many, many traditions and spiritual teachers and um, different uh, approaches are given to help us to develop our spirituality. And so let us remember that we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And therefore, we need to develop our own worldview. And if we do, then we'll be able to encounter very, very difficult situations, uncomfortable situations, and draw these amazing gifts from them, which help us become the best versions of ourselves. Today, I want to end on a practical example. Today, I've given you a lot of theory about how uncomfortable situations, if we become comfortable with them, they can help us in our life. But I want to end today by sharing a real life story with you. And that story is the story of one of my good friends. His name was Janaki Nath, or for short, we used to call him JD. We both studied at university in London. And in 2002, I became a monk. And six years later, he studied at King's College and he decided to take the same path. And therefore, he entered the monastery. He was young, he was dynamic. He grew up in the suburbs of London. But he had a great desire to share spirituality with the world and explore it in his own life in a deeper way. And therefore, at the age of 24, he became a monk. He would travel in many, many forums, sharing wisdom in a relevant way to help people in their lives. And here on the top, you see a very, very famous talk that he gave uh, at TEDx in East Anglia, England. And this talk is available on the internet. It's called There Is No Negativity. And if you like, you can watch it. But at one point in this talk called There Is No Negativity, JD flashed up a slide on the screen. And he said to the audience, I want to share with you the greatest gift that I received in my life. And everyone was excited to see what that gift was that he received. And he said that up until the age of 31, I had received so many different gifts in my life. But I want to share with you this gift, which was actually the greatest gift. But when it happened, was like the biggest life quake I had ever gone through. And then Janikinath brought up this picture on the screen. He said, this was the greatest gift I received in my life. And he showed this picture, which is a picture of a tumor, which was uh, growing in his colon. At the age of 31, he went to the hospital with stomach pains and he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And the doctors told him, you don't have long to live. Uh, it's practically irreversible and you maybe have three to five years left in your life. From that life quake, something which changed his entire life uh, in, in overnight almost, Janikinath uh, ended up living five more years. 
And uh, I wrote the story of his life uh, in a small book entitled Loving Life, Embracing Death, The Story of the Smiling Monk. But the amazing thing that I saw and I document in this book is how Janaki Nath had learned the art of becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. When he learned of his cancer, he didn't fight it, he didn't get frustrated by it, he didn't get de demotivated, dis depressed, but rather he saw, let me see what gifts I can take from this. And so what he did at the age of 31 after becoming a cancer patient is he started organizing retreats for other individuals who are going through the same difficulty of cancer. He taught them spiritual principles, meditation, which could help them to lead better lives. He documented his own cancer journey and all the chemotherapies that he went through and the techniques that he used to remain positive. He wanted everyone to know about his journey because he wanted to share with everyone that even the most difficult situations in life don't have to uh, ruin your life, but they can actually uh, evolve and elevate your life. So he would take pictures of the operations, he would take pictures of his journey, and he wanted to share that life was never the same after he learned about his cancer diagnosis. He said, life, on that day I realized life will never be the same. But he said, on that day, I also remembered life can still be beautiful. And not just be beautiful, be more beautiful than ever before. Janaki Nath was diagnosed with cancer in, at the age of 31. And at the age of 36, he passed away. And a few weeks before he passed away, I was speaking to him. And he said, the last five years of my life, have been the best five years of my life because I've developed the best relationships. I've had the deepest spiritual experiences. I've had the most fun and I've been able to render the best contribution I can to people through my own cancer journey and empowering them in that journey. And in that way, he said, uh, we have to teach the world this art of how to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. And therefore I'll end with this quote, which I hope you'll remember today and you'll, I hope you'll remember in your journey through life. Your emotions will be controlled by one of two things, circumstances or character. Focus on developing your character and your circumstances won't matter. And with that, uh, I'm, SBK Shivaswamy and I've tried to share some thoughts with you to help you look at uh, uncomfortable situations and the inevitable discomfort of life through a new lens. I hope it's given you something to think about. If you'd like to learn more about the wisdom that we're sharing then you can go on our social media channels and our website and uh, looking forward to connecting with all of you again in the very very near future and thank you for being on this call and being so patient and I guess up now we have a little bit of time I think we have another 10 minutes left so I'm very very happy so, yeah I'm very happy so to on take on behalf of our yeah. extend team I would really like to extend my heartfelt uh, thank you to uh, to you Swamiji for gracing us with your presence Thank and you. delivering an outstanding talk. We truly really, uh, appreciate the time and effort you took to share your expertise and insight with us. So the speech was really insightful, engaging and inspiring. And we are grateful for the valuable lessons that you have shared. Uh, to my audience, like thank you for attending and making this event a success. Uh, like really I see a lot of reactions on the screen. And uh, yeah, so we hope that you find the talk as valuable and enlightening as we did. So let's go over like some of the questions. Uh, please uh, uh, type your questions on the chat and I will I will uh, just speak uh, to the speaker to answer for you. Uh, uh, is it possible to ask uh, over the audio? Um, yes, if, if, yeah, so we can go one by one. Yes, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, so Swamiji, you mentioned that uh, focus on the character. 
uh, circumstances is something maybe not totally in our control yes so may uh, can you share what are the ways we can focus and develop further on our character oh thank you so much that's a beautiful question thank you anand um when i was traveling in india at the age of 21 i became a monk and when i was traveling in india i i met many eminent spiritual personalities and one of them i asked him for some advice on how to develop my spiritual character and this is the advice that he gave to me he said every year disconnect for one month every week disconnect for one day and every day disconnect for one hour he said if you disconnect then you'll be able to connect with the world in a more powerful positive and progressive way and so the first thing that i share with people yes the first thing i share with people is that if you want to develop your character if you want to uh, explore your inner world and become the best version of yourself if you want to take time to uplift and elevate your own qualities and personality then it means you must spend time uh, developing your internal life time away from the world time away from the noise uh, as monks what we do is every single day we rise before the sun we call it the 5 a.m. club and we wake up early in the morning and we meditate we reflect we journal we uh, read spiritual wisdom we discuss with other spiritual people so they can get, give us an elevated uh, vantage point and by taking the time to disconnect and do this these kind of activities then what happens is you then come back into the world but with an elevated uh, consciousness you then begin to see all the events of life from a much higher vantage point because you've taken that time to develop your inner world so how do you develop your character i would say take time away from the world to reflect to elevate your wisdom to discuss with spiritual people and to basically change your inner eye remember your darshan your world view of how you react to situations i hope that helps thanks okay thank you i'll go over some of the questions on the chat so swami ji any thoughts about sqs spiritual question versus social question yes uh as opposed to did you say social question yes 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 what we would say is that spiritual quotient is is separate from social quotient social quotient is something which is more to do with emotional quotient so let me like try to define these a little more clearly iq refers to your analytical and intellectual capacity emotional quotient relates to your ability to uh, regulate your emotions to control things like anger greed emotional quotient relates to your ability to resist temptation uh, resist distraction and emotional quotient also relates to your ability to interact and engage with other people in the world and therefore social quotient is uh, encompassed within emotional quotient because so much of emotional quotient is about how we interact and relate to environments and other people but spiritual quotient is very much to do with one's inner world one's orientation one sense of purpose uh, so spiritual quotient is to do with the deepest why why do i exist if i ask you why do you work for intel and then i ask you uh, why 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 and and i just keep going back to your deepest why then that is basically your spiritual quotient it's uh, it's your intuitive vision of reality and your orientation and direction in life and so spiritual quotient and social quotient are different thank you so much thank you uh -huh. so the next question is uh, you mentioned about the ups and downs uh, so Uh, as uh, question is shouldn't one cut short the down in the ups and down uh, basically shorten the time and only see the ups in life 
Yes, yes. So when I say become comfortable with the uncomfortable, am I saying we shouldn't try to mitigate pain or we shouldn't try to reduce those downs? No, one can definitely do that. However, one should also make sure that along with doing that, they're trying to get those six gifts that I was mentioning. In your pain, don't just try to mitigate the pain. But while trying to mitigate the pain, also deepen your wisdom, also build your character, also recognize that there are newer opportunities opening up for you, also recognize that this is strengthening your resolve, and therefore don't just go through the pain, but grow, G-R-O-W, grow through the pain. And so I'm not suggesting that we just learn to live with uncomfortable situations. What I'm saying is that we try to also, along with mitigating them, also understand that they're happening for a reason and that there's something we need to gain from those experiences. And I'll just say in a different way, I think there's a difference between running away from a situation and walking away from a situation. When you try to mitigate the pain and shut it out um, without learning, then I think you're running away from the situation. But when you try to mitigate the pain and at the same time do the internal work to try to understand what am I supposed to learn from this, then I think you're walking away from the pain. And I think those are two very different things. Thank you so much, Swamiji. So, next question by Apurva. Any tips that we can do every day to improve our reactions to uncomfortable situations? One thing that I've done for the last 25 years is to journal. And what I often do at the end of the day is I go through situations and I analyze my reaction. I analyze my character. I analyze what I could have done better. And I analyze what lessons I can draw from uh, everything that happened during that day. And what I find is that when I'm more thoughtful about how I've acted in the past, then what will happen is I'll be more thoughtful when making decisions in similar situations in the future. I'll share with you a very, very interesting fact. It said between the age of 0 and 25, age and wisdom is proportionate. So that generally a 14 year old is definitely more wise than a 10 year old, generally. Because age and wisdom is proportionate. But after the age of 25 to 75, it's said that age and wisdom is not more proportionate. Because after the age of 25, you don't learn in an educational system. You learn through the experiences of life. However, you don't just learn through experiences in life, you learn through reflecting on experiences in life. And therefore, a 35-year-old could be much wiser than a 65-year-old, not because they've had more experiences, but they've reflected on the experiences they have gone through, and therefore they've learned a lot of things of how to live in a more progressive way. And so, if you want to react to situations better, I would suggest journaling and, and analyzing uh, how you've reacted uh, previously and then utilizing that wisdom to act in more progressive ways moving forward. Thank you so much. You beautifully explained. Um, next question by Deba Shruti. Uh, how to deal with the anxiety while dealing with the uncomfortable situation? Thank you so much. Uh, it said that man is a social animal and therefore relationships are what help us to frame our own emotions. They say it's difficult to see the picture when you're inside the frame. And therefore one of the most important things to developing one's spirituality and also maintaining one's uh, emotional stability is having good friends. Because practically in the world, what we see today is that people suffer from crowded loneliness. We have so many contacts in our phone. We have so many friends on our social media. But how many people are we deeply connecting with? 
that will actually help us in the difficult situations to number one maintain emotional stability and number two have the ability to draw deeper spiritual growth from the painful situations we encounter and therefore I would urge um, everyone to that we all invest in meaningful relationships Thank you, Swamiji. And we have like two more questions. Can you please share two to three psychological, spiritual techniques which we can use during the initial stage of a life quake uh, when the mind doesn't think clearly? Oh, yes, that's a very nice question. I would say the first thing is um, the traffic light principle, which is pause. Pause and avoid judging something in the moment. Pause and try to reserve um, some kind of judgment or conception of that situation. And I know that's very, very difficult because we immediately have an emotional reaction to things. But uh, at least avoid acting on your emotions. And what happens is that breathing space when you immediately go through a very difficult situation helps you to bring in more wisdom which will give context to your emotions. So the first thing is take time just to pause. The second thing I would say is uh, reflect. Reflect on the past. Reflect on situations that you've gone through similar to this or situations that others have gone similar to this and see what you can learn from those situations and see that um, it's not all doom and gloom. That even in these difficulties, history shows that people have um, come out of it stronger and uh, more spiritually in tune. And therefore, the second thing I would say is after pausing, reflect and see what positivity you can draw in this situation to at least try to move forward. And the third thing I would say is uh, discussion. Discuss the situation with others who are close to you, who know you, who understand the pain that you're going through, but who aren't necessarily in the emotional turmoil that you're in and try to gain their perspectives. Um, on uh, how, how you could be more positive in this situation. So in, uh, in summary, when you go through a life quake, number one, reserve. Reserve judgment and reserve some time just to breathe and not emotionally react to it. Second thing is reflect. Um, try to draw on previous experience of how this can be positive and what beauty can come from this. And the third thing is relate. Go to your relationships and see what you can, what strength you can draw in discussion with those who know you and love you and have the spiritual wisdom to help you. Okay, thank you, Samiji. Uh, I will take we go over like uh, yeah. I, I'm just going over the question on the uh, chat. Please type in there. Uh, so the next question by Jaydev. Uh, please suggest to recommend five to ten good books on spirituality enhancing character. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> there are so many good books out there. Um, I think there are different genres of books. For example, I think there are um, there are books. One type of book I would suggest you read are stories of people who have gone through very difficult situations and their mindsets. I think biographies are very good. That's why I tried to write this uh, biography, Loving Life, Embracing Death, The Story of a Smiling Monk. Um, and there are many others in the world, great biographies. So I think that's one genre. I think another genre is self-development books, which break down th things into very bite-sized life hacks. So, for example, recently I was flicking through uh, a book called Atomic Habits, which many of you may be um, familiar with. And these kind of books really break down um, concepts into daily things you can do to become the best version of yourself. And the third type of genre of book that I would recommend you read 
are those books which give like deep wisdom and philosophy and, and spiritual insight. So for me personally, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, an ancient Sanskrit book from 5,000 years ago, has been a great source of information and, and has really furnished me with deep principles which have allowed me to frame life and, 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 and develop many of these mindsets like becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. So there are some ideas there uh, for you. Yes, Swamiji. So I think we are uh, over time, so we'll just take like one or two questions more. Um, from Dhanu, uh, how to handle the conflict that we may have with different worldviews among peers or family members? Yes. The first thing is I would say that conflicting opinions with others isn't necessarily bad. Um, they say every disagreement doesn't have to be an argument. In fact, sometimes interfacing with people who have different opi opinions and ideas and approaches can actually help you to become more and more established and more and more wise in your own consciousness. I think one of the worst things we can do, do is try to constantly surround us ourselves with people who think the same as us. And so I think don't be scared about diversity of opinions. Don't be scared about people who look at the world in a different way. But try to deeply understand what you can learn from them and how their approach to life may uh, nourish your understanding in a, in a different way. But then I would say um, the main thing is that when we interface with people who have different opinions, that there just be uh, appropriate, um, uh, how to say, principles of communication. In other words, I think the problem is not so much that people have different opinions to us, but I think the problem is how they then make each other feel and how they can demotivate or uh, minimize each other because of their different opinions. That is what we have to be careful of, but not the fact that there is difference, because difference actually nourishes uh, a higher understanding. Okay, thank you Swamiji. One last question uh, from Manjunath. Uh, how to make mind to be in present and not in a race into the future? <laughs> I think we all struggle with that. If we go to the deepest reason why the mind goes to the past or the present, if we actually go to the deepest reason why that happens, it's because the present isn't exciting enough for us. The present doesn't fulfill our mind. The present um, doesn't inspire our heart. The present isn't in line with our purpose, our essence. Um, the purpose doesn't really drive hunger within us. And so one person once said to me, make your day dream your day job. <laughs> and I always try to use that as a guiding light in my life. And though that may sound utopian, because every day we have to do things which are not our dreams, but are just duties. But I would say the more and more that we craft a life which is in line with our principles, which is in line with our um, ultimate purpose. Um, what the ancient scriptures would say, Dharma, when you live in your Dharma, which is your ultimate purpose, then you're more likely to be in the present rather than in the past or the future. So try to make your daydream your day job. And when your daydream becomes your day job, the mind won't uh, gravitate to the past or future, but it will be more and more satisfied in the present.